If you've ever been to a theme park with someone who considers themselves an enthusiast, you've probably heard a spiel that goes something like this. No, no, trust me, man. Sit in the back. It's way better there. The forces are stronger. Come on, dude. Meanwhile, the station is empty except for four people waiting for the back row and ten people waiting for the front. You just want to get on the ride and enjoy yourself, but eventually you get beaten down and wait the two extra trains for the back row. And it's hard not to wonder, is it really worth all this fuss? Unfortunately, I am here to tell you today that yes, the seat you sit in really does change the ride experience. And with a little bit of maths, I'll show you how. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you don't mind, please give this video a like, uh, comment if you want, and if you like my other videos, why not subscribe to the channel? It really helps a small content creator like myself against the YouTube algorithm. The structure and setup of YouTube makes it really difficult for smaller channels such as mine to succeed, so any bit of help that you can give will be extremely appreciated. Thanks, and enjoy the video. Now, first off, a disclaimer. Not every back row is the same. Roller coasters come in many different shapes and sizes, from short, stubby wild mouse cars and Eurofighter trains to the long, nearly 20 row two seat trains you can find on some Arrows and Intamins. If you're hopping into the back row of a wild mouse expecting some serious changes to the ride experience, you're going to be disappointed. But in most cases, where you sit does have a pretty noticeable effect on the forces you experience throughout the ride. The longer the train, the more dramatic the effect, but even relatively short trains like the standard B&M four-seater trains can make a big difference. Which is why it should be illegal to ride a B&M Hyper anywhere but the back row, but I digress. The reason for this difference is a phenomenon I will describe as whip, and the reason for its existence comes down to the design of a coaster itself. First, let's see what we're working with. Assuming a multi-car train, of course, roller coaster trains are made up of independent cars which are linked together by a physical connection. So while every car is free to articulate and bend with the track, the whole train is tied together and everything moves at the same speed. This allows roller coasters to take very tight elements. And the weight of the train is an important part of the ride's physics, and calculating six, eight, even ten separate weights at once is kind of intensive. Luckily, since every car is connected, we don't have to consider every single car separately. We can consider the entire train as one mass, traveling at one speed with a singular weight that acts as the train center of gravity. And that center of gravity almost always lands right in the middle of the train. This is the design point for the ride. This could be thought of as the point which generally dictates the physical behavior of the whole train. Thankfully, we have a really easy real-world example to point out the center of gravity to us. If you ever sat in the front car of a roller coaster, you probably noticed a few seconds where you're hanging over the first drop, but the train continues to move at the exact same speed at the lift. It's a really funky sensation. Now this happens because though your car may be over the drop, most of the train's weight is actually behind you, and the weight still needs to be carried over the top to make it over the hill. The coaster begins to accelerate the moment the center of gravity passes the top of the lift, aka the middle car. And that's when things really begin to pick up. You feel the opposite effect in the back. After the middle car passes over the top of the hill, you will suddenly begin to pick up speed even though you're still pointing towards the sky. And this is why first drops in the back are so much more powerful. I'm afraid at this point that I have to introduce math, specifically Newton's second law, which is pretty much the backbone for all modern physics. Thankfully, this relation is simple. The force you experience on a rise is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. F equals MA. At its core, designing a coaster is using Newton's second law to dictate the delicate dance of force that forms the backbone of every coaster experience. Now, it's time for a math problem. For the purposes of this video, we'll take a very simple example, a floater airtime hill. What's floater airtime? It's a feeling on a ride when you rise out of your seat and feel like you're suspended in midair. Of course, you're not actually floating, but what's happening is that the train is accelerating downwards at the exact same rate as gravity, so both you and the train fall to the Earth together in perfect harmony. This gravitational acceleration is a constant 9.8 meters per second worldwide. If you've observed enough modern roller coasters, you probably notice that airtime hills almost uniformly follow a very specific shape, a shape known as a parabola. 
And this is because with constant gravitational acceleration, the train's vertical velocity will continually decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease at a constant rate. In a floater airtime hill, of course. If we turn that velocity profile into distance, we get a second order equation, 1 half gt squared. Plot that, and what do we get? A parabola. So if a perfect airtime hill is shaped right, the trajectory of the train will exactly match the shape of the hill and boom, zero g. That is, if you're sitting in the middle. Now our coaster train is long and heavy, but the cars are rigidly connected to each other so everything moves at the same speed. This holds true even though the front and the back rows may be 20, 30 feet, 50 feet away from the center of mass. The front of the train hits the top of the hill first, but since the center of mass hasn't reached a peak, the front flies through the hill going faster than the designed speed. The train then slows down more and more as the center of mass approaches the peak, and the whole thing happens in reverse. The train starts to pick up speed again as the center of mass passes the tip of the crest, and now riders in the back sail over the top faster than the front. More speed equals more energy, and more energy equals more air time. And if we look at the kinetic energy equation, we can begin to see how these effects grow so dramatic. The kinetic energy of a train is equal to 1 half mv squared, which is the square root of velocity. So as the train moves faster, our energy increases significantly more. The further you sit from the center of mass, the faster the train will travel through the top of that parabola. And since gravitational acceleration isn't keeping up with that added speed, you start to physically eject from the ride, as the train literally pushes you down to hold you in. Now the front and the back are basically opposites here. In the front you get thrown out of your seat as soon as you begin the ascent up the hill, and the airtime continually decreases in strength as the center of mass passes the top of the hill, at which point you move through the rest of the element more slowly than the rest of the train. It's a strong initial hit that slowly dies down. In the back though, you get less airtime in the ascent. However, about halfway through the train speeds up relative to the track design, and the airtime gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you land back in your seat. This is the sort of dragging feeling that happens when you're sitting in the back row and go over an airtime hill. My favorite sensation. This phenomenon is amplified more dramatically the further you are from the center of mass. So in a nine row train, row four and six won't feel very different from row five, but row one and row nine will feel considerably different. Both the front and the back are very different experiences and everyone has their preferences. I personally prefer the back, but there are some rides where the airtime is stronger in the front. You gotta keep in mind that many ride elements don't follow a super rigid formula. They conform to their terrain and there are plenty of twists and turns added in. A lot of old wooden coasters, for example, are better rides up front because of the slow, flat turnarounds which litter the ride. In the front, you pop into these turnarounds with speed and get a great little jolt of airtime, but the back crests the hill slowly, which provides almost no lift. And the turnarounds bleed enough speed to weaken the airtime coming down significantly. What about inversions, then? Well, inversions follow a very similar principle. The front of the train going into a vertical loop, for example, slams riders with very strong positives right away. The back doesn't give you the strong forces immediately, but you get dragged through the element as the middle of the train clears the top of the loop and gravity begins to pull it down. The best examples here are the classic tight arrow loops and rides with really long trains. As you can see in the picture here, the back of this train is barely at 90 degrees, while the middle of the train is clearing the top. So the back car gets to feel a strong pull through the majority of the inversion as you are constantly accelerating. So to bring it all home, yes, your annoying friend is right. Coasters are better in the back. And now you know why. Thank you for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you stayed this long, I do have a quick appeal to make. It's been a blast making videos for these past few months, and I really appreciate all the kind words and comments I've received on every single video. They make all the hard work worth it. And that said, as a small content creator, I have had a lot of difficulty getting my videos to reach a wider audience. This isn't something I care about in principle, but I somewhat underestimated the amount of effort that making these sorts of videos involves. And if you don't know anything about YouTube's payment scheme, YouTube doesn't pay small, small content creators at all until they hit certain channel milestones. To date, I've not received a single cent from any of the videos I've posted, and I've put hundreds of hours into this channel by now. Unfortunately, I'm a graduate student with a lot on my plate already, and I just can't keep producing content at the level I am right now in the future just to drown into the YouTube algorithm. If things stay the way they are, I'm going to have to cut back a lot. 
So if you enjoyed my videos so far, it would mean the world to me if you can help my content in any way that you can. This could be as simple as leaving a like or a comment. Maybe there's a video of mine from before you enjoyed. Give it another watch and share it with your friends. And of course, if you haven't already, please subscribe. The subscriber number controls my ability to monetize these videos, so I hope you can get to that magic 1,000 number so this crazy idea to rant about coasters on YouTube can hopefully start to make the tiniest amount of sense. That said, I am grateful for all the incredible support and interactions I've had with all of you so far. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and with your help, I hope I can continue to build this channel to where I want it to be. Like Starsky and Hutch, stick to clutch. Yeah, I squeeze three at your cherry M3. Bang every MC easily. Take that. Take that.